Good morning. Today I'm going to try to give a 16 minute, maybe shorter presentation on ciliates. This one's scary for you all because I've been working for cili on ciliates for over 20 years. So I know a little bit about them. Um, and I have some slides. And so we'll dive right into the slides. I want to just give you an overview of ciliates. And I want to start by arguing to you that ciliates do everything but drive trucks. OK, maybe not quite that. But ciliates are incredibly diverse. And one thing that I want to draw out is that they're just beautiful, so aesthetically pleasing. Here's just some examples of ciliates with their many different shapes. And this one is a suctorian that has these little tentacles. I'll say a little bit more about them. Just to show you some images, here's a scanning electron micrograph of one called condylostoma. Here's a beautiful guy called stentor that we, we see later on. This is a multi-celled ciliate called sorogena. It doesn't matter what it's called, but it actually uh, makes this ball of resting stages and excretes a stalk. And we'll talk about these when we get to multicellularity. Here's another one here, blepharisma. Some people in my lab work on this one. This is a beautiful ciliate, didinium eating paramecium here. So ciliates can be voracious predators. In fact, this is one of the fundamental ecological experiments came out of using these guys in a predator-prey relationship. Some ciliates build shells. So this is a lorica or a test of a ciliate and it has diatoms that it's glued. It's an agglutinator. It's glued diatoms to its outside of its shell. This is a ciliate we'll see at the end of the lecture. If you've noticed, it has a mouth here and it has a mouth here. And this mouth came um, in a way I'll describe at the end. But the key thing here is this is a ciliate that's been injured. It's repaired to have two mouths and these two mouths are heritable which is a Lamarckian trait. This is a beautiful ciliate called Lacrimaria with this long dynamic neck. And we often see these in the greenhouse. They're just spectacular to watch. There are very few ciliates that are parasitic on, um, there are no parasites of humans. And this is one that's a parasite on fish. So if you raise fish, marine fish, fish that gets something called ick, that's actually an epistochond. But freshwater fish that get ick, it's a ciliate called ichthyotheris, which is closely related to paramecium and tetrahymena, and it causes these skin lesions. Other beautiful ciliates we've seen in lab, halteria, which hops through the water, euplodes, which can crawl on top of the water with these bundles of cilia called ciri. And then there's these sectorians, which actually um, have no cilia as adults. They are tentacled as adults, but they actually give live birth to ciliated embryos. Um, these are also voracious predators. They use these tentacles to poke holes in these paramecium and suck the inside out and spit out the little outside of the paramecium. And like I said, these guys give live birth in one of three ways. They either brood ciliated embryos that they then, um, they brood these embryos on the outside, they break off with cilia and sit down and transformed into tentacle ver versions. They can brood internal um, babies or they can brood babies inside out that they basically regurgitate and push these little ciliated embryos away. Um, but these are live birth viviparity in a ciliate. The fossil record of ciliate is mainly limited to uh, post-Cambrian about 450 000, million years ago and it's mostly these shell building things called tintinnets. Here's a lorica, a clear lorica, and then we get these agglutinated loricas. So here's the cell of the cilia, here's the cell, and then here's the shell. Just to show you one more of these shells, this one also is glued diatoms and haptophytes, coccolithophores, all to the outside. So these things leave a good fossil record. Many other ciliates do not. Ciliates are, have a very complex uh, cortex with all sorts of terms. I don't want you to know complex ciliature, but they have these alveolar sacs, which is what places them within the alveolate, alveolates. In ciliate taxonomy, people spend a lot of time distinguishing oral versus somatic body ciliature. And if you do a cross section, what you can see here is some mitochondria. And then here are the eukaryotic flagella with their nine by two plus two, each little two, these are two microtubules. And then ciliates have all of these other complex microtubule structures with names like kinetodesmal fiber. And it's this part of the ciliature that's been used to do ciliate taxonomy for years. 
They also have extrosomes. Here's like a little bag of poison that they can shoot out and I'll show a picture of that in a minute. It's like a torpedo just below the surface of their, their um, pellicle. Uh, also, here's the outer membrane. They have alveolar sacs. And in truth, we don't really understand what alveolar sacs do in ciliates, but here they are. Um, here's the cilium or the flagellum, same word. Ciliates have lots of diverse morphologies and development, but I'll just point out that they all have a mouth and an anus, a cytosome and a cytoproct. And here is a cytosome and paramecium bringing food in and the cytoproct emptying waste out and the food vacuoles are now traveling through this paramecium. Um, here, some of them have, this is actually like a basket for its mouth. It sort of sieves food in through its mouth. They also, as I mentioned, have extrasomes, which are like little torpedoes that they keep. Um, they have many kinds of them, and I won't bore you with all the names. So here's the cilium, but extrasomes can exist underneath. And a, one example would be a trichocyst, which is honestly like a torpedo. This, you might think these are cilia, but they're not. This is actually a ciliate that has been um, disturbed in a way that it's now ejected all of these little torpedoes. They're protein based and they look like this under a, a high power microscope with little ends that they shoot out at predators that are attacking them, for example. Here's another just close up of one of these trichocysts. It's like sitting underneath the cell membrane, ready to go like a torpedo to blast out. And here it is blasting out with its pointy end. As you know from our mitochondria lectures, many but not all ciliates have mitochondria. This is a phylogeny of ciliates. These are outgroups, um, some dinoflagellates and AP complexins, and everybody in black has a mitochondrion and the red lineages lack mitochondria. And these are lineages that live in swamps or uh, abi anaerobic sediments, and others of these live inside other animals. And the hypothesis here is that they have lost their mitochondria and that these mitochondria have become converted to hydrogenosomes. So that should sound familiar from the mitosis discussion. Reproduction in ciliates is quite complex. You'll read about it in your readings or you have read about it in your readings. The thing to know is that like us, ciliates have dimorphic nuclei. I like to ask students if we're haploid or diploid. Many students say we're diploid. Of course, we are predominantly diploid but then we have haploid nuclei in either our egg or sperm. Um, and those haploid nuclei don't express genes in humans. Ciliates are the same way. They have a germline nucleus and they have a somatic nucleus. And the somatic comes, well, actually both of these come from a zygote, just like our eggs or sperm and our soma originate as a zygote. So this also means in ciliates, they have, they have an unusual process of sex called conjugation. And here are two ciliates conjugating. They conjugate sort of mouth to mouth and they exchange germline nuclei. We'll see that in a minute. Whereas division in ciliates is completely separate from sex. They divide in this direction. So they, the new cell has to make a new mouth. One cell gets the old mouth, one cell makes a new mouth, one cell gets the old cytoproc, one cell makes a new cytoproc. Division and sex are separate in ciliates. Um, that is opposite of uh, flagellates. When you see flagellates nose to nose like this, they're dividing. Flagellates don't conjugate. So ciliates can divide and it looks like this, um, nose to butt. And when they're kissing, they're conjugating, they're exchanging germline. If you look up close at a ciliate, you'll see it has a large somatic nucleus and these somatic nuclei can be highly processed and derived versus the small germline nucleus called a micronucleus and macronucleus germline soma. Life cycles of ciliates are really complex. I put this one here, but I'm gonna spend more time on a different version in a little bit. But what I like about this one is it says that conjugation where two ciliates of different mating types swim together is very different than reproduction. So here you have a red and a green swimming together. They exchange germline nuclei to give a new blue zygotic nucleus. This zygotic nucleus divides by mitosis and one daughter will become the new soma. The old soma goes away. All of this happens in parental cytoplasm. To make more ciliates, now we have a new germline and a new soma and these cells divide by cell division. The germline divides by mitosis and the soma divides by amitosis, which means not mitosis, which means we have no idea how they divide. And that's because some ciliates have 25 million chromosomes in their somatic genome. 
So no mitotic spindles in a somatic genome with 25 million chromosomes. Ciliates therefore have to come together. So these are these sessile suctorians with their tentacles. They have to come together to exchange nuclei. And I um, want to point out that ciliates have really strange nuclei as well. Some look like beads on a string, some look more normal looking. But these suctorians have these big lobe-like macrosomatic nuclei. And so when they're dividing, when they're having sex, all that's involved are teeny germline nuclei, which are not shown here. But when they're going to go through division, and they're budding, what they do is essentially break off a part of the soma and take a germline and swim away. So if you think about these budding ciliates, this one here will bud off by taking a piece of soma and, part, and a germline and swim away, which means those somatic nuclei have to be structured so you can break some off and have another generation. How does it work? We have no idea. But here's a, a drawing of what might be going on. Here's this complex soma. Um, with all these little teeny germline macro and micronuclei. And when they're going to divide, this one started with a nice single that all of this goobly guts comes together to a big blob, a little bit breaks off, and each one of the daughter takes a piece of soma and a little germline and they swim away in this species, eventually leaving the parental case empty. So I want to end by just focusing on some molecular things. So I want to have, invite you to hold on to three facts about ciliates. They have genome duality, uh, duality. I already talked about that. Some of them have extensively processed genomes in their soma, and they have crazy epigenetics. This is our favorite lab rat ciliate, Chylodinella unsonata. It should be italicized, I apologize. Here is its soma, this, the somatic nucleus where all transcription takes place, and here is the quiescent germline micronucleus. Here is its oral opening with a basket-like um, oral aperture here. So three points, ciliates have distinct germline and somatic nuclei. The germline is also called the micronucleus. It's transcriptionally inactive. Here it is. The soma is the macronucleus. It's functional and contains processed chromosomes. All ciliates, it's a defining feature of all ciliates. This means in the life cycle of a ciliate, here we have a ciliate with its germline and soma, and this is just in brief with many of the steps left out for, for simplicity. The germline goes through meiosis, which of course, you know, leads to four identical haploid nuclei. Three of them go away and one divides by mitosis. So these are now identical haploid. And during conjugation, the cells exchange these haploid nuclei. Then that new zygotic nucleus goes through mitosis to give rise to two, two daughter nuclei of, that are the merger of this black and white here to give gray. Meanwhile, the parental MAC degrades, and one of these daughter mitotic products becomes the old MAC. Um, and then the cells will go on in the same cytoplasm, same parental cytoplasm. They'll go through asexual. This is the same parental cytoplasm, and then they go through asexual division. The germline goes through mitosis, and the soma goes through not mitosis. In the old days, we thought that this parental MAC just went away and was irrelevant. Now we know, and I'll say a word about it in a minute, that this old soma is actually telling the new soma what to do in a Lamarckian or epigenetic manner. The other thing I want to tell you about ciliates is that there are three groups of ciliates that have extensively processed genomes. So they are called extensive fragmenters. And in their somatic nuclei, they have gene size chromosomes. It exists in these three major clades of ciliate. And so every protein coding gene ends up on its own chromosome. So alpha tubulin is on a chromosome about 1.2 kilobases. It has telomeres. And then those miniature chromosomes are amplified maybe a thousand times. So you have extensive processing in the soma. So if you have 25,000 genes, each goes on its own chromosome and amplified a thousand times, these ciliates can have up to 25 million somatic chromosomes. To visualize this, if you were to take a, an agarose gel, and here's a, just a ladder showing size, if you ran out, for example, an animal genome, it all sits up here at the top. It's bigger than 10 kb. Animals have huge chromosomes. In a ciliate, the germline sits up here, but the somatic genome is, it consists of all of these hundreds of miniature chromosomes that just smear out here across this gel. 
very strange organization, germline soma. Um, and again, this has evolved at least twice in ciliates, and there's some more data that suggests it's even more complex. So the second point is extensively processing. Um, what this means for the ciliates is all population genetics is different um, in these extensive fragmenters. So if you imagine these as traditional long chromosomes with two um, genes, hair color, eye color, or two metabolism genes, um, normally, in most eukaryotes, genes are linked, and if this was a deleterious chromosome, it would be linked to all other genes. In these extensive fragmenters, every allele, every duplicated gene, everything goes on its own chromosome. So the ciliates have the ability to eliminate these deleterious things from their soma, even though they're sitting up in the germline. But it changes everything we know about population, not everything, it really shifts what we know about population genetics in these guys. And the third and final feature that I want to tell you about ciliates is that epigenetics is really widespread in these organisms. And I'll talk about morphology and then give you just a hint of some molecular data. So here is a ciliate with a single mouth. Should you decide to do microsurgery on this ciliate and cut it here or put these ciliates in with some broken glass and shake them really hard, you get all sorts of craziness, and if you were to damage the ciliate along here, I mean, many of them die, these ciliates can repair themselves, and after this sort of damage, they repair themselves to have two mouths. Now, that's not really so surprising. If you've walked along a beach, you might see a six-armed starfish or a seven-armed starfish instead of a five-armed starfish. But the thing about starfish or sea stars is that when they divide, all of their offspring return to having five arms. In this case, these ciliates with their two distinct mouths will give rise to offspring with two distinct mouths, and that occurs whether it's through conjugation or asexual division. So it has acquired two mouths, and these two mouths are heritable for at least some number of generations. Awkwardly, one mouth is sweeping food in, but the other mouth, the chirality of the proteins is such it doesn't feed, it sweeps food away. Nonetheless, these guys can live in the lab for some time. Epigenetics, Lamarck. Just to give you a final slide, or maybe one of the final slides, if you look at tetrahymen and paramecium, for example, people have now shown that this sort of epigenetics plays a role molecularly as well. If you normally have this purple sequence normally only in the germline, if you inject this normally germline isolated sequence into the old soma, it will appear in the new soma. If you delete something or inject an overload of a deletion in the old soma, it appears in the new soma. I'm happy to explain the details if anybody wants, but the bottom line is these uh, several labs now have shown that the parental soma macronucleus talks to the daughter macronucleus. The mechanism appears to be an RNAi, small RNA-based mechanism, and the key thing to know here is that the, what happened in the last generation can impact the next. It's as if you went to the gym and got really buff and then your offspring were born with big muscles. This is what the ciliates are doing. We see epigenetics morphologically and molecularly. So that's what I wanted to tell you about ciliates. I hope that um, you learned something new today and I look forward to meeting with you all again soon. Take care everybody. <laughs>